Oh, I'm going to follow the obvious. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are still looking for not taker and jabber. Someone would volunteer. You know, taking notes. Guys, any not takers? Sandy? Would you take notes? Would you take notes? Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to Prague. And we're about to start RIFT meeting, ATF 104. Uh, let's go. 12. So please read not well if you haven't before. And we are about to start. Okay, so a uh, very quick update uh, on the working group status and plan. We have the uh, base protocols settled. Um, Tony uh, will provide a detailed update soon in this uh, session. We also have two um, interoperating in implementations uh, except that uh, security envelope in the both implementations and except some features in the open source implementation. Uh, again, the, uh, a detailed update will be provided uh, later. So uh, our plan and ongoing activities are that uh, right now we, for the base protocol we're basically going into a soaking time mode. Uh, we plan to issue the last working group last call by the next IETF. 
we already requested a security AD early review, and we are looking for reviewers uh, for the protocol and specification itself. Um, the core team has been working diligently uh, on this uh, all the time, um, but we do want to get uh, reviewers from outside the core team so that uh, we have uh, actual sc scrutinization on this. Um, multicast discussions are ongoing. We will have a, a presentation on that as well today. Uh, young model working is ongoing. Uh, we are still looking for volunteers working on the applicability statement and threat analysis documents. Those are the, uh, the milestones uh, already set for this group when it was chartered. There are other work that like a um, policy guided prefixes and SI extensions. We have uh, drafts that uh, got split out of the base uh, spec. We have not really, uh, we have not started serious work on those uh, yet. But those will get done, get started once uh, we, we settle the, uh, the base protocol. Do you have any? So the protocol spec itself has been progressing really nicely, young model hasn't, we really need to catch up on the latest development in the protocol spec to have young model matching it. So I'm looking at authors, please make sure data model is in sync with the protocol itself. Yes, now as the co-author of uh, Rift Young Model, uh, we have tried to keep the consistency with the protocol draft, and uh, we need uh, more implementation and uh, verifying for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going. Um, Alor Tana, just being a pain about the process. Um, the threat analysis we had agreed that it would go for publication with the protocol spec. Sorry. Um, we had agreed on the charter that the threat analysis would go for publication with the protocol spec. Um, so just to reinforce what you said, please, you know, let's work on that. If we're going to last call the spec by the next ITF, we need to really get working on the other stuff. Yeah, that's all understood, and we also requested the early review from security to get first set of inputs. Blue sheets, please sign them. So uh, we have a slight update on the uh, agenda. Um, uh, Greg Mursky's uh, BFT presentation, it was already scheduled at the very end, but we're going to pull it forward uh, after Tony's provides an update on the base protocol uh, specification. Um, Tony, you're on next. It should work. It should work. Wow. Okay, morning. Ah, starts to look like early OSPF work group meetings. Just the eclectic crowd. Uh, I'm slightly under the weather, so don't expect my usual, you know, wittiness. Um, chairs are slow as well. Mm -hmm. I downloaded it earlier, but I'm having trouble finding it now. <sighs> Sorry. So Bruno is hanging out somewhere in Argentina, having fun. Refused to come and give, you know, show his struts. <sighs> All right. Test, test. Very good. All right. So we published 04, like a clock. Um, what happened in uh, very rough terms? Uh, yeah, three. Bump to four. Uh, pretty much the whole spec, base spec is done. Um, lots of open source code has been written. We interrupt the stuff on a regular basis. Bruno's framework allows basically to plug any kind of implementation. There was talk of some third implementation, but you know, talk is cheap, code is hard. Um, 
And we had this once or sometimes twice a week, these meetings in Zoom that works like a charm. You just push record and for like an hour, hour and a half, you just share stuff and toss stuff. Extremely productive, normally three, four, maybe five people. Some providers come in just to listen and like three people are cranking the stuff. Um, the whole spec is on Git, so you know all the people can go and modify the stuff. Basically, action items are taken at the end of the meeting, and then people can work on the Git and action merge. Uh, it's extremely productive model. I mean, you, if you can go and tackle a problem like that in ITF, I, I think. All right, so see, all green, very good. So uh, last time, about a third was still um, yellow. There is this little outlier, little tail hanging off, which is orange on purpose, because there are some excellent multicast ideas being tossed around. Uh, we went through a couple of iterations. It looked for a bit like a, a pin by deer, but uh, we realized that to build pin by deer is kind of beside the point, right? You can run pin by deer as, as overlay, but the ideas that are being tossed around now are actually quite novel, revolutionary. Uh, I think Pascal has a prezzo and will walk you through some of the thinking. Uh, one hard problem remains unresolved. By my gut feeling, we resolve that, and then we see whether the multicast become part of Rift, but it will not be part of the base spec. I think even the timelines until something uh, changes, and I talk very quickly about uh, why that is not a problem. All right, so rough statistic, just to give you an idea, again, you know how much work is being done. So we have this core contributor list. Somehow it evolved that way. I don't know why we don't do it on the Rift list, but you know that's the chairs. Um, so we have hundreds of threads right, that are flying around. Uh, we have on the open source version about 380 commits. So if anything, it's really accelerated. We had 205 you now between the last ITFs. Alvaro. Um, sorry, just real quick. Why don't you do this on the ITF mailing list? I don't know. It just fell out that way. Can you please do it there? Not my monkeys. I'm happy, stuff's progressing. You don't have a problem, right? You, you don't have a problem with the discussions about the protocol happening on the mailing list for the working group? Well, uh, the, the, the core design team, basically, they, it's a, they have the, they they have but their daily um, not, not weekly discussions um, it just happened and then they, they, it's on the on that uh, it's actually not a not a mailing list uh, it's just the people just use the nothing the nefarious process, about right? that membership so bad right. because people ping me or that them and they mostly fall off don't ask me but you saw I mean on a weekly basis there's recording the synopsis so that's where everything happens anyway. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm perfectly happy with uh, it. I'm just saying, it would, be, it would be nice. The ATF process is open, there's a list, et cetera. Um, you know, if I look at the list, there's nothing, right? Yeah, there's very little because everything is going on this, you know, this. And it's not even a list, it's just this. Everybody copies everybody. That's pretty much it. And, you know, I, I, I don't have a problem. In the future, I want to avoid problems when we go to the AESG and we look at the list and there's nothing. And, you know, it would be nice if there was some discussion there. That's all. Oh, you know, I can copy paste the stuff. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, mean, I have some kind of a folder and I post this couple hundred things on the email. We can always do that, not a big deal. Um, so like I said, uh, we had about twice the volume of, you know, of commits on the open source. A bunch you know, of people started to contribute, lots of stuff started to get poor, uh, pulled in. Um, if you also see the size of the patch, which is you know, a very rough indicative when you run just a diff from Last ITF to this, you know, what is the diff coming out? It's, you know, like 25K lines of code. The last time was about 16K. Um, I expect this stuff to trail off significantly now. Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the spec has been done also in open source. Um, but what you see is that the spec slowed down significantly, right? So we have like 5K diff lines compared to like 7K diff lines. And last time we had seven models change on the protocol, you know, encoding and the models, and now we have three, is it really like trailing off? Um, of course, no, millions of ideas, uh, uh, love the dynamics, right? Extremely open, stuff is being tossed, lots of stuff is being scrapped, um, the very good dynamics will be kind of a pity when it starts to wind down, but that's the way, you know, way of the world. 
So what changed now? What did we do to actually make everything green? So um, uh, there was a lot of discussion on the security envelope and it led all the way to security models and you know, talking to a bunch of people actually running fabrics, like what security models, what, what would you, what do you desire? Not what can you have today? It's like, what would you desire? So we have kind of a security model for the fabrics and you can basically go up, down and scale and it's a trade-off. Uh, out of that, the security envelope went through a couple of iterations because we had to accommodate those security models. And uh, my ambition was actually to address all the threats that the IGPs today cannot address for historical reason. And I think we did a decent job on that. Um, we moved this, we shortened a lot of types and put sequence number arithmetic in. That's kind of, you know, minor, but still, you know, something that needs to be done and has to be done carefully to not to break things. Some link capabilities moved in. We. Someone probably just run a you know, BIOS update over the internet on the microphone or something. Um, so the flooding, so we did a lot of uh, flooding scaling, a lot of, uh, and I'll t we'll talk about the hackathon monkey testing, and uh, one corner case emerged, um, two? I don't remember. So we actually, uh, I think we have the flooding now completely in place and we're highly confident that the stuff works, which is like, you know, the, the main engine, right? Um, Clarification on flood reduction, because Bruno implemented flood reduction, so he, of course, asked a lot of stuff. And when uh, this stuff was going on, more discussions happened, and Pascal, I think, started to talk more in, de in depth about the in-cast problem, which I explained quickly, flooding in-cast, um, which I already had a solution, but didn't explain why it is in the spec. So when they asked the question, we started to, to, to tear the problem apart. All right, so the security model, nicely misaligned. Uh, so I think this is this is quite quintessential, and Don wrote most of the stuff, and there was some pointer, right? I can, oh yeah, cool. All right, so, uh, yeah, I can like read here pointer. So um, so we what we realized that there is like a, the convenience of zero touch provisioning is actually a counter, um, force to security, right? So if you really want to run a zero configuration fabric, you really don't get much of a security at all because anything can plug in and just work with it. And when you move up the scale, you, you know, you can start to start to fix things to make sure that it doesn't show up in funky places. So you can say, okay, this is your level, don't show up in any other place. But then you can go to something which you call the fabric association model which is a funky word for everybody has the same key, right? Shared key. And if you have the shared key, you want the fabric. If you not, you're out the fabric. So you know, that's kind of intuitive. Then we move to something which we called node association model, which is basically, you know, everybody has to verify the guy he's talking to. And we thought that's the date of it, but actually it's not the date of it. There's a far more interesting case, which we call the port association model. So. If I bring up a node and I have a lot of neighbors north or south, I could just take any of my ports and just plug it down in the correct structure and it would work. But certain people are very concerned that the correct port is plugged into the correct port on the other node. So that kind of corresponds to a key pair on each interface. All right, so that of course becomes more and more provisioning intensive and integrity of the fabric goes up, all right? Whereas if you go down, it becomes more and more convenient. And zero configuration, you know, there's literally no rift configuration. Everything just comes up when you plug it in. Or, you know, when it's mismo area, it doesn't come up. All right, so uh, when we looked at, uh, so there is actually already a section which is kind of a threat analysis. In reverse, we basically describe all the attacks and how they are mitigated. So maybe that can be just ripped out and be the nucleus of the necessary you know, threat analysis draft. Um, and what we do uh, more above the traditional routing protocols is that we protect the lifetime. And I talked about the staff. Um, 
which was kind of the last thread, which is open on the IGPs, I think, you know. Um, so we published something on ISIS, but those are more like band-aids, you know, making it harder to attack, but not really preventing the attack. We have nonce exchanges uh, on all the um, adjacencies, which basically prevents any kind of um, replay attacks. Albeit, uh, when you read the spec, we have been very pragmatic how we go about the nonces. So we leave open a window, otherwise you have basically to sign every single packet. It's just, you know, you know the load is, is excessive. Uh, we do not encrypt, so we see what the ADs come back from. We do not consider that um, uh, confidentiality is a desirable, you know, uh, property of uh, a routing solution. And, and the cost is, you know, very high. Uh, we provide origin integrity, which means that if people inject something in the network, they can only do it if they have the correct private key. And we do uh, the, uh, provide the integrity of the adjacency, but that does not mean that we build a trust of ch uh, chain of trust. Those are subtle differences. I'm sure the security aides will have discussions with them. Uh, so you could pass something which is origin integrity through adjacency which is not protected and then put it into protected adjacency, which means that you did, don't have a chain of trust, right, that we cannot guarantee. And we can talk why this is not necessarily desirable because operationally it's, it's basically undeployable normally. All right, so we do not provide confidentiality and we don't provide a chain of trust. All right, so now, of course, we do the, uh, you know, the usual ASCII packet prone, right? Um, so a couple of things now went into this envelope. I was kind of bent against the envelope thing. I wanted everything like just being the model, but that does not work for a lot of practical purposes. And the envelope kind of takes stuff out that cannot really be modeled. That is the kernel of how protocols work that is not very amenable to modeling. And I walked it quickly through. It's kind of interesting. So we stuck Rift Magic just because we have some bytes left. And it's kind of cool because then the silicon can look into it, right? Because right now we run on UDP, any kind of port. If you, if you now want to build silicon that knows this is Rift, give it priority, whatever, or snoop the stuff, there's, there's no way you can do that. So what we stuck in is basically a Rift Magic behind the UDP. And that gives you a good chance that you, that you grab a Rift, right? We didn't have a better idea. Behind that, we have something which is kind of novel for routing protocols. We put in a packet number, which is an optional thing you ref up on every packet type that you're sending. And that allows for very nice debuggability because you know when you're losing or when you're misordering. And you can act to that in different ways. All right? So, and that is not protected. But there are no really, we couldn't imagine any meaningful attack. It's optional, and if someone gives you this indication, it's kind of nice to have, makes for nice debuggability. You know, lots of stuff that came out from talking to operators, like for example, we sent on adjacencies all the names of all the ports and everything, and people loved that, because today when they misplug, they, they have a hard time to figure out who is on the other side, right? Whereas this thing, ref to automatically, you see who is on the other side, right? The port and the name or whatever not. And then we have an outer key envelope. And the route, outer key envelope carries the major version, which is very important because that tells you, can I even decode the model? So when you bump up the major version, you're not running two, you're running three, which means if you two, you cannot decode the model. That is very important. Otherwise, basically, you try to decode, you, you deserialize, just breaks down. You have no idea what happened. Corrupt packets, something. Um, we have an outer key ID, which is basically a local key on the interface. So that way I can, I can do the interface integrity, right? We can both agree and roll over the keys on the interface. Uh, then you have a fingerprint length, which is basically the fingerprint, and from there everything is fingerprinted. Below the fingerprint, you have two things that you need to protect, and local nonce and the remote nonce. So both, what are nonces, if people are not security aware, those are just random numbers that people bump up regularly, every couple of seconds on both sides. And that prevents replay attacks. How? Because this fingerprint protects the whole thing. So if you give me a nonce, which is too far from my local nonce, or I saw your remote nonce, and now I see the packet where you sent a remote nonce, which is too far from what you gave me as a remote nonce, I know that someone's trying to, to play, to do a replay attack. And those nonces don't have to be particularly big because it's always the combination of both sides. 
So that's for all practical uh, purposes, closes any attack window down to like few seconds. Um, and if you try to record those things, you have to wait for the right combination, record it, and then you have a very short window because someone will bump up the norms, right? Which you cannot replay. Uh, that has been done before in, in things like secure PNNI and so on, but it's not that well known in IT, especially in the routing protocol. So that's, you know, we put the whole thing in. And then we also have the remaining lifetime, which is protected. So that's kind of the new stuff. But it's taken out the model. The model sits all the way in the back. And there is a reason for that. So when you push it over an adjacency, you can change the lifetime of the tie very, very quickly, very easily, without mucking around with the serialized model object. Actually, you should not muck with the object. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a sec. Uh, and then what we have is an inner key idea, which is really origin validation. Why it is bigger? Because this has to be agreed on the fabric, right? I have to know that this guy sent it, but I have to know which key is it uniquely on the whole fabric. Actually, from the inner key ID, I know who sent it, who originated it, sorry. Right, so that's the originator ID in a sense. And uh, fingerprint land, and that fingerprints the model object, which means when I'm originating, I'm taking this key that everybody knows on the ID, and I fingerprint the serialized object. Now, the serialized object is now being carried around as a binary blob. So why? Because we did also some work to understand um, how we extend this protocol, right? So how do you extend these models, these, these schemas? And we found that if you run an object through a SIR, DSIR, you, you may very well deserialize some things, reserialize it again after changing, and you may, and may end up with semantically the same thing, but a completely different binary object because your serializer just encodes things differently, which means that you would lose the origin validation, right? So if I receive that stuff, deserialize it, change the lifetime, reserialize, I lost the origin validation because I cannot fingerprint it. I don't have the originator key. That also is very, very good for, so it gives us backwards compatibility. People can stick optional elements, and if I deserialize and I cannot deserialize it, you, I'm still flooding that through. Basically equivalent to ISIS unknown TLV model. Plus it's very good for speed, right? Because I don't have to reserialize every time I'm sending out lifetime changes and so on. All right, link capabilities, uh, Basically, what we realize, we have to announce whether the other side supports BFD, because you have to know whether the BFD is supposed actually to come up or not. We, we kind of missed that. We were exchanging discriminators, then we realized, like, oh, what does it mean? Should we send an unknown discriminator? So we just put, put a link capability saying, I run BFD or I don't. Um, and, you know, with the assumption that there will be things added in the future to it. All right, so flooding rules. Um, yeah, open source implementers ask a lot of questions. Um, so one thing that was not very well specified is when you flood and you have lifetimes, um, you don't look precisely at the lifetimes, right? Because there's a transmission time, there is some queuing delay. So if you become too hung up on the lifetimes, you will always say, oh, those are not the two different, uh, the ties are always different because the lifetime is mismatched. So there's always this fudge factor. You say like, if these lifetimes are pretty close to each other, um, it's the same tie. That's just usual IGP stuff. So we had to spec out a constant. I think there was not a constant where Bruno asked questions. Um, we had the last case of flooding inconsistency, uh, which was kind of interesting in the sense that you needed a three levels on top of each other, and you needed the right sequence of reboots. So you had to reboot those nodes in certain sequences, and you also needed a specific property of the initial sequence number that was originated. Because sequence numbers, we don't start from zero or one. We actually fudge them for a lot of reasons. So we start from something from a range, and it had to start from a lower range than the last range and so on. You can read that up, it's explained. But it was kind of cute. And it's a, in a sense, it's a property of Rift because we only flood north, right? A normal protocol could flood south, but we don't flood south down. So if something flooded north, is newer than the stuff that comes up, there is no way to flood down again. The fix is actually not very hard, but you know, it was, it was interesting. It behaves very, very differently from a traditional protocol. Uh, 
there was a cosmetic change which only come from kind of like playing people playing doing weird stuff with it is that if you have ZTP ZTP does strange stuff before it really settles and looks like the thing that it's supposed to look because people it's completely unsynchronized protocol right so you may end up having server thinking there are roots or whatever or, or you know tours coming under the servers because they didn't see the root yet and so on and when the flooding kicks in it's misdirected because people who are actually ultimately know things that are south so they're being flooded information where they're not supposed to have so when everything settles you know it's hard to cause it of course i mean all this stuff was like monkey testing interrupt stuff doing weird things jumping up and down on the bed um, but we saw cases where there's useless information right because the spf and so on were disregarded but you're still stuck up with some stuff that looks why is it here? So the fix was also relatively uh, simple. We basically said that um, when you change your level on ZTP, you just have to flush out all the other ties. That works like a charm, but it's also no unusual. All right, so that's kind of flooding. Um, uh, I think it's solid now. Uh, no, that will definitely not work. Can you give me the PowerPoint? Because I need those pictures. Sorry. I only have the PDF. I sent you uh, PowerPoint right. yesterday, so we need to pull that up because that's kind of you know, interesting and meaningful discussion. How are we doing on time? We good? Yeah. Are you already overrun? About five. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Like five minutes plus. Yeah, I'm kind of you know, slowly winding down. Do you want to continue talking through next slide? Uh, well, I don't have the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, actually, where, where did I write this stuff down? I still had something to say. Uh, no, I talked about uh, extensibility, and we actually wrote code with uh, Bruno over a couple of languages, couple of uh, serializer, deserializer, to make sure that we can actually move the, in practical sense, we can move the protocol forward with optional schema elements, and everything will work. And also, can flood it through people who don't understand it. The decoders will not hung up. You know, um, this kind of stuff. Um, but I think I talked about the stuff. All right, but now this is what can I do with it? All right, so that will be interesting discussions once uh, they manage to pull up the PowerPoint. And there's a smaller stuff. So packet numbering, I talk about that stuff. Uh, so we actually have this and we also have throttling from the other side. So I can, for example, see that if the guy throws the stuff at me and I see a lot of misordering and um, losses, I can squelch on the guy. On, on, on the lie, saying like, you're sending too fast throttle. And that allows pretty much the flooding rates to be adaptive and basically always run with the maximum, you know, uh, flooding rates. So the flooding rates are on Rift or, you know, like orders and orders of magnitudes better than any other protocol right now. Um, type tightening, so we made types much smaller, so like sequence number, packet, packet numbers, like, you know, nonces where 64 bit was used less. And we also had to fit them in the security envelope. And also, that's where we did the work with the sequence number rollover stuff, the arithmetic. I put the arithmetic in the draft and so on. And we also advertise uh, unsolicited optional downstream label uh, on the lies. So it's basically you get, in a sense, you get LDP for free, okay? Because people ask for it. I don't know how they use it. And that's it. So the, only the in cast discussion is still open. And that was already in the draft, but again, you know, I just cryptically wrote down, do this, don't ask. But then, of course, Bruno and Pascal ask. So I explain and I put the explanation in the draft why it is, you know, cool and necessary, you know, especially cool. <sighs> Sorry.
Uh, so this thing doesn't work on it. So you have to scroll. You have to scroll me forward, please. Yeah, I just I just need these two pictures. One thing. Yeah. Fantastic! All the tools we're having, man. Everything's broken. Ah. No, I don't see the picture. So before you had an illegible picture, now you have no picture. You pick. Now, otherwise, I pull up my laptop and we hook it up. You want to do that? Oh no, you have only this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Ah, the times of the overhead projectors weren't all that bad after all. No, no uh, all right. So I tried to give you like, you know, a story, which of course won't work, it's too complex. <laughs> so uh, I had one picture to explain again how flood reduction in Rift works, which is kind of a uh, Pascal's idea, which is, uh, you know, an interesting bastardization of the way Mane was working. So every node from below is basically picking enough nodes above it to make sure that you get, you know, double coverage of people even one layer higher. And that's all recursive. And it's also load balances because each of the southbound nodes can pick up a different set of what we call fraud repeaters, right? I think you can follow that. I just take all these people above me and I look for enough random people to make sure that people above them, everybody gets two copies, but not more because that's where all the flood overhead starts. So that both reduces and balances. And for actually five level fold it's, uh, clause, it's uh, arguably also optimal. When you go higher, it, you, 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 get, you do a little bit too much, but it's still, I mean, ridiculous. I mean, we're talking extremely good numbers. But now an interesting problem starts when you reboot the node, because you start to advertise that you have nothing. So everybody tries to give you everything, because don't forget, north, everybody still holds everything. It is just they don't repeat to a level up, but if the level up reboots, then everybody will try to give them the stuff, right? And you could say, oh yeah, okay, so if you're a flood reducer, if you're not a flood leader for this type of information, don't propagate it. But it's kind of fragile when stuff reboots. So the incas reduction works like that. The first time I see a description and it would force me to send the information, but I'm not flood leader, I suppress it. The second time I send it. So it has a, a lot of positive stabilization properties, right? Which means that on the coming up, you get an incas reduction. You have all these people spread, and the information is only repeated twice, each type of information from different nodes. But if you're in any kind of transients, and you re-request the stuff, the whole thing will stabilize, because then people have no choice but send you a copy. Which means like if the flood leaders somehow didn't do their job, the whole protocol will possibly, uh, positively self-stabilize. And that's pretty much the trick. Oh, I don't even dare to ask who followed that, okay? But, you know, the, I'm sure the picture problem will get solved and you can look it up in material on, on my two beautiful cryptic sketches and then the stuff will make sense. All right. Or otherwise, just see me after the session and we chat it on paper. Yeah, the, the PowerPoints uh, uh, you see on, uh, in the where, where the slides are uploaded, if you open it from your PC, you, uh, you should be able to see the picture. It's just somehow that uh, on this uh, Chromebook, uh, it's not coming up. Yeah, I I will not this you know snipe at companies and tools. All right, that's it. So uh, mic's empty. Any questions? We good? Dazzled and confused. All right. Okay. Questions, comments. No questions means it went either extremely well or extremely bad. All right. 
or all the questions will come once people implement it. But then it's too late. So, good. Chicken? Greg. Greg Ski. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Okay. And uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate their consideration and flexibility letting me present it uh, today. Um, so it's called extended BFD. Um, often at BFD working group, uh, we refer to it as um, BFD 2.0. No, I'm not that ambitious, but we'll see where it leads. So what's the motivation? Um, in discussions of BFD working group and um, uh, many uh, ideas being uh, proposed and uh, uh, appear, some of them uh, were accepted, some deemed to be, well, yeah, yeah, we would like to do it, but that's probably not the way to do it. Um, it became uh, clear that uh, BFD at, is, was uh, designed, does great job, as was it was uh, intended to do, to monitor uh, path continuity between two BFD systems um, and over many different uh, network layer encapsulations, but we would like to do something more. And uh, what to do it, what we would like probably to piggyback some um, quality, uh, performance monitoring, uh, path MTU discovery, and quality of BFD session itself how stable it is, because the only thing that we know is when BFD session fails, so misses uh, N packets uh, in a row, and N is a parameter of um, detect multiplier. But we don't know if, uh, if detect multiplier, usually by default it's value three, if we lose every other BFD packet. So we are very close. We are very bad situation on the edge, and we don't know about it. So um, to extend BFD uh, beyond what it can uh, does now is to ensure backward compatibility and extensibility for whatever features possible that uh, offers of this uh, proposal haven't thought about. And. Uh, Okay, you want it now or you want to hold it uh, up? Yeah, no, just uh, we didn't think, you know, we didn't get to think. So just one question. Architecturally, I mean, does that not overlap, overlap with TWOMP very quickly? Uh, okay, first of all, uh, clarification on TWOMP. Uh, TWOMP does require a control plane. So this, if anything, I can compare, I will compare probably to STAMP which is only data plane um, test packet format and procedure. Fair enough, yeah. Thanks, that was what I looked for. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have here the format in a you know, 64K view. We have the same original BFD control message as defined by 5880. We have a guard word, which kind of, you know, our thought of maybe um, extra uh, caution to detect whether it's really extended BFD or something weird, and then followed by TOVs. And TOVs can be um, contain sub TOVs. So TOV and TOV, and even probably might be for some other reason another TOV inside. Um, the whole thing starts with a capability negotiation. And that's insurance backward compatibility. So how? Uh, the idea is that um, BFD control message does have a length field. And length field stays as defined by 5880. So it reflects the length of BFD control message. Uh, in IP encapsulation, total length field reflects the length of extended BFD packet. Okay, Tony has an opinion. So that's 
uh, again, uh, in the discussion, uh, there are some implementations that do look at IP uh, total length and expect it to be reflective to uh, only uh, BFD control message length plus header, uh, but some implementations don't. So for implementations that don't make this check, that will work um, normally, or you basically get their uh, implementation that supports it. So if there is a classical 5880 uh, BFD implementation, it will not send um, final back because uh, this uh, negotiation uses a uh, pulse sequence. Pulse sequence is you send a control message with a uh, pole bit set and you expect that acknowledgement, if it's acceptable to your peer, that he sends the message uh, with the final bit set. So if you receive with the final bit set and you receive uh, extended packet with a capability uh, uh, agreed upon, then your set, you can do proceed with extended BFD session. If you don't receive a final bit set after your uh, timer expires, or you receive BFD packet uh, 5880 without extension, then, well, you have to fall back to the classical BFD. That's it. Um, question, no aspirations to do jitter? Uh, jitter what? Jitter measurement or? Yeah, uh, jitter quality, just like you do delay and loss. Uh, we'll get to that because that's in, um, uh, following up. So, so the first the first step we need to determine capability okay we, we need to determine whether we can use uh, BFD extended or we have to use BFD let's call it classical but jitter you have to do double marking so you also have to negotiate it no uh, okay I'll get it so okay, basically sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry Tony um, in capability negotiation, um, so this uh, capability is a little bit ambiguous because I didn't want to go into it. Uh, we'll get to that, uh, what, um, how to measure loss and delay and everything. Uh, next slides. So uh, let's assume uh, we are conforming uh, to extended BFD uh, implementations they agreed upon, and we want to do performance measurement. So the performance measurement can be uh, realized in two ways. Uh, one, it could be that extended packets uh, will include, okay, that's an old slides and um, it's a typo. It's not 6473, it's 6374. <laughs> um, so my apologies. It's uh, MPLS um, packet loss and delay measurement. So the idea is we, we take uh, these messages that are already being defined and implemented by many and we insert them in the TOVs in a BFD packet. So that allows us to do direct or inferred synthetic loss measurement, and it allows us to do delay measurement uh, and use the timestamp formats, uh, whether it's PTP or NTP, by sender and reflector independently, because there is explicit indication of the timestamp format uh, by the side that fills in. So yes, we can measure jitter, and uh, it can be measured either uh, one way, uh, putting extended BFD uh, with the uh, performance measurement TOVs uh, in control messages sent in asynchronous mode periodically, or it can be used in a pole sequence as a um, echo request reply because pole sequence will be followed by the uh, packet with a final bit sent by the far, far end. And again, um, 6374 uh, supports um, um, collection of four timers or four counters or combination. So basically you can do either uh, loss measurement, either delay measurement or combine loss delay measurement. So that's basically capture of uh, um, control message from 6374 for loss measurement. This is for delay measurement. And this is when they combine. The only, uh, what we introduce is just one word of uh, 
type and length to be included in extended BFD uh, packet format. Again, uh, there was an, it, there is interest in uh, doing path MTU monitoring. Might be path MTU discovery if you wish. Um, so again, use extra padding TOV, and you can operate it the way you want it. And again, it's nice because you can do it either as a pulse sequence, echo request reply like, or you can use it one way uh, to far end. And if you wish, if uh, MTU changes for some reason, or you like over a multi-hop uh, BFD using, so you have a convergence underneath, then uh, if you're using uh, in uh, con uh, conjunction uh, with the asynchronous mode, then your session will fail. Because MTU change, so your uh, packet is too big, then the far end would not receive it, three messages in a row, you have uh, failure detection. Again, it could be used either way, as monitoring or as detection of the failure. Uh, next steps, uh, uh, we'll be continuing uh, adding details because uh, for direct mode, uh, this uh, extended BFD can be used uh, to fetch uh, results from the far end, because uh, in uh, one-way uh, measurements, uh, other uh, measurement results and calculated performance metrics are still sitting at the far end, and there might be interest on fetching them. Uh, at the same time, um, it will definitely be interesting to do their uh, Yang model, because then this performance metrics can be just exported uh, for the Yang, uh, well, discuss, discuss, discuss. Welcome, common suggestion and cooperation. And if you want some entertainment, then I will be presenting this just 15 minutes from now at BFD Working Group, and I hope there will be more discussion. Um, so right now, uh, specifically on Rift, which is extending discriminator, uh, exchanging discriminator, sorry. Uh, nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. If this extend BFT kicks in, I mean, there's no far information. Yep. Yeah, yeah the, this is excellent. Yeah. Especially like this MTU things and so on, which have been piggybacked into the wrong protocols for right, historic reasons, if we do that, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So basically, it doesn't need anything more than discriminator. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's uh, very interesting, uh, interesting for this IP fabric folks because, you know, the jitter, the delay, the stuff is, this is very relevant for them, you yeah. know. Uh, the if, discussion of that stuff on a periodic basis, you know, before they bring up the links on a periodic basis, you no know, monitoring the link quality and so on is very important for them, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, please include BFD working group uh, mailing list. Much appreciated. Thank you. Open source applications, or see, you want to talk about open source applications? Yeah, hackathon is good. Hackathon is good. All right. So we had a hackathon on, on Rift. This is not a participant, and Bruno also ensured me that when he took the photograph of the gentleman, the gentleman signed away all his rights, so he has the waiver. Um, I don't know even where it's taken, somewhere in South America. So Bruno is some interesting places. I have the fun job to take his material and present it. Uh, I don't even know what is on the me thingy. We thought maybe record a presentation or something, but you know, experience has been poor with remote presentations, so we just go with the standard deck. Uh, okay. So, 
uh, we did cow's monkey testing um, on the protocol, first iterations. I think that will be the future of this August body. If we want to stay relevant, we have to learn how to do modeling and we have to learn how to cow's monkey test modeling, uh, just to ensure the quality of what it delivered on extremely short time scales. Uh, right, I mean, it's a well-known methodology invented on 360s, long forgotten and now pretty common, while well, we didn't catch on yet. All right, so uh, I don't have to tell you that. So who was there? There was about four people and about like three or four hanger-ons who didn't write code, so they don't get to be mentioned. Um, so all these guys were hacking code and what we were doing, all right, what we were doing was, we took the open source implementation that uh, you know Bruno, Bruno largely chucked out. We generated some configuration for what Bruno considered large. I consider you know fairly smallish data center topology, and then we ran basically bought a bunch of AWS instances, and we just started to bring the stuff up um, and explain you know. Uh, Actually, maybe the other presentation explains how this stuff is multi-instantiated. We basically started with containers. Uh, they're okay, mildly pain in the butt. So Bruno went to namespaces, which have lower scalability, but it's very, very easy to bring you know, the Linux kernel topologies up, stripped together. Um, and then when we brought the stuff up, we just jumped down a little bit on it using random scripts. And then we uh, basically started to look, is the protocol converged, which actually, on a protocol of that complexity is not a trivial thing to assure. So I took a, no, we ended up in the hackathon writing a lot of code actually figuring out whether we got what we expect. Uh, there is a hackathon instruction document, Bruno's very diligent, so you can install all the stuff. There is like an instruction video that he put out on YouTube and so on and so on. So it's very, very accessible, ex you know, exceedingly well documented. So, that comes all out from the scripts. So that's one of these topologies generated. And what we do is uh, each of these routers is basically a Python process. It runs its own network namespace. And we just brought up tons of VETH, which is like virtual ethers, and just strapped the stuff together. Um, no particular magic. And that's like one of those graphs that the things generates. The way we generate those topologies is that there's a meta configuration describing a fabric. Uh, you know, it, it's still fairly primitive in a sense. It doesn't allow you more than like, you know, five, five folded uh, claws or pods with uneven height. It will evolve. That stuff generates a configuration for every router, scripts to start and stop because you have to be able to log into different namespaces and then generates chaos monkey scripts which shake stuff up and down and generates also the check script, right? Uh, to check actually, to go to all these things, gather all this information, reconcile it and figure out, yeah, you have a topology that actually works, right? And it does pinging back and forth and these kind of things. All right, so um, like I said, we generate this chaos script that generates perturbation, you know, like brings things up and down, jumps up and down. Uh, we'll talk about what will be the next things. Uh, so right now, uh, bidirectional link failures, node failures, uh, so what we observe, unidirectional link failures will be interesting, packet drops, uh, reordering delays, and of course, corrupting packets. But the problem is just corrupting packets, randomly shooting bytes doesn't buy you anything much because the protocol will not converge, right? Uh, it does the expected. So you have to understand what the variables mean in a boundary condition, which, you know, like when you do the Google Chaos Monkey testing on software, that is like all well-known methodology. Uh, then you repair all the breakages and you see whether, you know, the protocol is in an expected state. All right, so that's one of the sequences. You start from a state, break a link, kill something, break another link, bring something, restart, like blah, 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 red, green, red, green, red, green. At the end, you have a sequence of greens that fix everything and you go, okay, did this thing survive? Are we in a full converged state? Some example chaos run. Again, documents, videos, all exceedingly well documented, you know, stuff breaks, 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 whatever fixes at the end. Um, so the check script is actually uh, topology aware and it knows where to look and I show what it looks at. It pings from every leaf to every leaf. Uh, we had interesting discussion. People start, of course, to play with it and they start to ask questions and recognize that Rift does, doesn't do certain things or expect certain deployment mode, right? Um, 
uh, there's nothing like running code and then an environment like that to actually start to understand what the hell is going on, right? Um, so we ping from all the leaves, whether all the nodes stayed up, all the adjacency stayed up, whether the node bound default routes were in the rip and the FIP and the kernel, right? Because there is a local rip, then it's get tie broken on the FIP based on the route preferences, and then you push it into the Linux kernel. So you have to verify the whole chain. Same thing for all the southbound. There's always more things in the future. So that's a, some convergence run where the check is being done, right? Where it checks all kind of consistencies and does some pings and so on. Um, what helps enormously with uh, Bruno's code is that you can generate this kind of SVG protocol runs. So you can basically slice out any kind of protocol interaction, put them on SVG, and you see all the packets timed, how they're flying through the network, and you can flip things on, off, and reorder, and whatever not. So this is actually, if you truly want to understand how the whole thing works, this is a fantastic educational tool. All right. so. Uh, we had we generated those topologies, we ran those topologies on multiple machines, and we did the chaos monkey testing. Um, we wrote code to you know do, do, do more and more consistency checking because we were looking manually for things. Uh, what we learned so uh, a, the open source implementation had a couple of issues with these things shook out. Um, for example, IPv6 flooding uh, issue where it is absolutely valid for Rift to come up and the one side floods on the IPv4, the other floods on IPv6 if you're running both address family. And they had timing issues depending how it was coming up, they ended up on the wrong socket or missing stuff. Um, of course, always the shutdown scenario and exceptions. When you break things, stuff starts you know, to shake. Um, uh, added multiple show commands because you start to inspect state if things doesn't go well, especially if it doesn't go well in very weird ways. Um, the protocol spec, we found nothing, right? So they, in, in this sense, that looks fairly solid. And that's the hackathon. Yeah. I don't think we won it, but I, I wasn't even there. It was, a, it was a zoo, like 350 people, three minutes presentation for two hours. What do you expect? You give people food and you don't charge for it. That's what will happen, right? <laughs> Questions, observations, nothing, general apathy. All right, I take the apathy. Resistance is futile anyway, right? <laughs> so that's another beautiful picture Bruno took somewhere at the end of the world. I think it's Patagonia or something. Uh, so that's basically what happened on the open source. That's his update. Um, so let me uh, rattle that down. So usually it's on uh, GitHub. Uh, so we started around 102 hackathon. So we just within basically what six months, we at the state where we have. You see how much is implemented. Uh, it's chucking along to become a complete Rift implementation. Okay, I mean, Bruno is ambitious. I thought originally it would be just a small subset, maybe just the server side. Um, uh, it was very uh, successful in improving the specification. No discussion there, right? Um, and uh, I could, I mean, I, I give him that. I would consider that a reference Rift implementation. Absolutely. I mean, the, the code is extremely good quality. It is completely geared towards someone to understand and learn the protocol, not for high performance, but for that as a reference implementation, beautiful. Um, and again, the emphasis is emphasis in being user-friendly, educational, very transparent, very debuggable. You can look at the stuff very easily and not road performance, uh, uh, understandable. Extensive documentation and completely unencumbered by any kind of, you know, uh, roadblocks like IPR or any kind of uh, vendor, you know, nefarious influence as it always is. Good. So how to get started? Just one thing to get you bootstrapped. When you get into the GitHub, there is installation, startup, everything just nicely rattled down. Um, good. So what was added? So Bruno added quite a significant amount of stuff since last time. Um, 
IPv6 adjacencies. So it supports fully the IPv6, which he didn't believe and then had a lot of fun learning how uh, uh, bizarre IPv6 multicast works, actually, until you get the stuff working, because you need that for the lies, right? Especially if you have link locals and they overlap and whatever not. Um, so you send both IPv4 and v6 packets to Kimowal to understand how the spec is written, right? And the order does not matter, and how the AFs come up does not matter. And there are implications that if you support v6, you can also forward v4. Um, I don't know precisely what he means, but the LIFSM must be and is idempotent, uh, which means like if you receive the same packet, yeah, you don't do a state transition, was somehow important to him. Um, all uh, right, so um, here he missed actually a point. So the V6 lies imply that the, the node does, v, the link does V6 forwarding and the V4 DITO, but you can also forward V4 over V6 only. Um, and uh, we didn't go through all the complications of trying to tear down address families. Once you up, you up, even if you st stop sending hello. So if you want to remove an address family from a link, you just have to bounce it. Um, if people are highly concerned, which I cannot imagine in the fabrics about that, then you know, we go and extend the spec. But those, those kind of things are exceedingly complicated. Um, and then uh, what took him a while was all of a sudden to understand how the flooding, well, it didn't take, take him a while. It just bounced into the stuff, started to read the spec and ask the questions. That uh, you can either flood on V4 or V6, so you have to open sockets for both and listens, and when do you open the sockets, you know, like detailed implementation stuff. Um, and you may end up sending v4 flooding one way and v6 flooding the other way and it's perfectly valid. And that was where the chaos monkey caught him uh, because no, the stuff was coming random sequences breaking coming up and he ended up in this asymmetric configuration which per spec is perfectly valid. Uh, so yeah, so here it is, IPv6 uh, v6 is very support, uh, dependent on the OS, OS version distribution, right? magic options to make the stuff work before multicast is much easier in this respect. So he has everything on Ubuntu. The whole thing is running Ubuntu right now. And uh, what he has is, you know, so these are kind of cute things. You start to understand how RF works, right? So this is show interface sockets. You understand how many sockets you actually have open on the interface to support all the stuff. Um, it could be less, we could receive and send on the same sockets, but he'd split it. We had discussions about the stuff. It makes for much easier logic on the protocol. Uh, so he implemented the flooding reduction. So the example algorithm in the draft uh, is complex. Yeah, it's kind of like really cute, doing your own kind of stuff. The beauty of the flood reduction rift is that everybody can run a different algorithm. It's completely, you know, asynchronous distributed algorithm. That what makes it so blazingly fast and stable. Um, so uh, we talked about the implications of uh, doing different algorithms and so on. He really implemented the stuff that Pascal put in with, with uh, the Fisher Yates um, and a lot of clarification questions. He actually you know, fixed the algorithm notation a couple of places where, where it wasn't simply clear what that means. Right? And here is, for example, the show flooding reduction, and that is way too small to read it. Um, it shows you like the flood leaders and I don't know what it's all showing. I, I think flood leaders last election and what, uh, don't ask me, I, I forgot it and it's too small to read. He implemented the whole SPF. Uh, so all that sinks in once you start to write code, right? So he was asking questions there as well. So that shows you the SPF and uh, which destination fell out through which system IDs, next tops. Um, uh, south and north split, and some stats. Uh, actually, there's far more expensive stat, uh, extensive uh, stats later. So you really run, you know, SPFs in both directions, and it's not really SPF. You can actually cover all the paths on the fabric because it's loop-free. So um, he did that. Then he implemented the whole rip, right? Because he didn't have a local rip. Because when you have south routes, northbound routes, external routes coming in, local uh, local prefixes all uh, all all over the place then you have to tie break for preferences, which have been already specified. So the local rep uh, was implemented, including ECMP, and then you have to show routes things, which shows you, you know, all the next hops and where the stuff comes from, from the north, and V6 routes, which are here ECMP'd over um, you know, multiple interfaces and link locals. 
so that's all working. And then, of course, uh, so sorry, so the rip holds, of course, all the routes, right, for the same prefix. Even you come from north, south, external, it holds it, and then it's tie, tie breaks it into the local FIP, which is just the best, uh, just the best, best route. So you can uh, go and look at the show forwarding, which is all the tie broken stuff ready to be pushed into the kernel. And then, of course, the kernel routes. So those, uh, you can also look at the kernel routes that he pushed down. And this is basically the local fit being, push, uh, being pushed down. Uh, I don't know even why he has a table, you know. Um, right. So I didn't play with that stuff extensively, except, you know, like collate it to make sure that the convergence is correct. And you also see the weight stuff, so the bandwidth, uh, uh, balancing is not implemented yet. Extensive statistics, uh, very cute, so per interface, node, engine, you know, because when you start to implement SPF, load balancing, you know, uh, flood reduction, all of a sudden, you are just, even understanding what's going on without stats is hard. There's so much stuff flying around. So the stats give you, uh, you know, on this interface, all of a sudden, you, you retransmitting all the time. Your packet rate went, went berserk or your packet rate collapsed. So you see for different packet types, you see uh, all kind of, you know, rates and what was the last change. Um, uh, that's all now implemented. Chaos testing framework, which I've already shown you. Um, ah, okay, so there's, here's a plugin. So there's a proposal uh, to implement Rift and FRR. So Alistair, you want to like pop up and talk about that stuff? Hi, Alistair Woodman, NetDef. Uh, yes, we're uh, looking for folks who are interested in uh, collaborating with the FRR community on a C implementation of this. So anybody who wants to talk about this can contact me directly after this meeting. I'll be hanging around, or you can come along at 2 o'clock this afternoon to the FRR uh, meetup. Yeah, yeah, so I assume it's well known what FRR is, like uh, the Quagga fork that lots of people are running. Um, uh, uh, Bruno is interested in implementing stuff in C, so there's, you know, they want to build a community. Um, uh, with the Rift Python, he pretty much, you know, explored all the red holes, so it's kind of a straight port for high performance stuff. Um, and of course, then that would allow to add the Yang models, uh, and, and, you know, they're looking to like get people engaged. All right, so the current status summary. Um, the adjacencies are uh, pretty much done. I don't know what's still missing on it. I have to quickly look. Uh, ZTP is done since a while, and that has proven extremely simple and stable. There's really no surprises with ZTP, except this stale information under you know, large fabrics, heavy load. Uh, flooding, I don't know what's missing there. Route calculation is half done. Uh, because of probably of the bandwidth balancing. Management interface, uh, uh, development tool chain, I don't even know what it is, but it's basically the, you know, the, the, the light green is what has been done between the last and uh, this one. So adjacencies, ah, yeah, clear, all right. So V6 adjacency have been added. I talked about the star, what is not complete is security envelope. Um, so we still have to implement the security envelope and uh, soak it. That's why uh, we are kind of holding back on the last call. And then, you know, I didn't consider the documents that Alvaro um, uh, requested that are agreed in the charter that still need to be delivered. Uh, we, we don't expect any surprises much there. That has been discussed very extensively. Um, and we worked a couple of times. Zero touch is done. Flooding, all right. So. The V6 flooding has been added and the flood reduction is done. Uh, so what is not com complete? So the efficient type propagation without decode, it's optimization, positive disaggregation. So that's the status as of two days ago, three days ago. Bruno has, has shown me yesterday night and, and told me to say that he's like three quarter done with the positive disaggregation. Beauty of symmetric, well-specced protocols. Once you crank code, you can go really fast. So he already has all the positive disaggregation in place. And then he had, of course, an interesting question where the spec is, uh, has the language of an oracle. So if you implement, you understand why it has to be written that way. But there was no surprises. Negative disaggregation, which, of course, 
is a little bit of a harder not to choose. I didn't say that we also on the spec, uh, we had to update. Uh, Pascal wrote quite an extensive example session section of the negative disaggregation. I mean, all seems to compute, but still needs to be implemented. Um, that's, of course, only of interest for multi-plane fabrics. So, you know, either very low radix fabrics or very large fabrics. Uh, the key value store, external ties, which, of course, very helpful, right? If you're redistributing the protocol, um, policy-guided prefixes, which is op optional. Um, yeah, overload bit, thin data overload bit, which is important, and the clock comparison for fast mobility. Uh, route calculation, what's not done yet, east-west forwarding, east-west links, uh, right, I said positive, he largely has done. Uh, the fabric bandwidth balancing, which is, of course, interesting, right? Uh, labor binding is trivial, and the multicast is something Pascal will talk about. There will be optional extension outside of the base spec, most likely. Um, management. Uh, no interest in implementing SSH CLI client unless somebody really deploys the stuff and start to you know, run production. Comment completion, Yang data models, uh, and granular debugging and tracing. I think here is a little bit you know, underselling himself. Uh, the stuff traces quite well and it's very easy to debug, especially, like I say, hackathon uh, for me and someone else who wrote, wrote you know, a good amount of code, like show commands and status. Um, uh, statistic have lots of stats have been added, and they added also the common history to the CLI. I didn't even know that. And uh, development chain, so Bruno likes 100% code coverage. He's like at 80 something. That bugs him. And yeah, there is an uh, uh, there is a demand, and that's actually quite interesting from people already, you know, like labbing and playing with the stuff to get a Wireshark plugin, which does not seem like an excessively difficult project to do, except that. Somebody has to do it because otherwise nobody will do it, right? Um, so that is interesting in the sense that you have to put into Wireshark a model, compile the model out, and include the model. But beside that, it looks like you know, just a Wireshark plugin. Uh, and it's also one of the reasons why the UDP got to magic, right? So it's kind of simpler to like grab the stuff. You don't have to say, hey, that's the port of running Rift on. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Um, I mentioned everything, yeah. Questions, observations? Just, just to clarify, uh, the other implementation uh, does have everything by the security envelope. Right, so the security envelope was just gelling. It went through a couple of iterations. So we have the security envelope, but in a different version. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the protocol development has the, the built-in uh, implementation experience with it to very sure. rare. Just to say that uh, the protocol development and design was accompanied by the the implementation stuff. And so. Yeah, right. So it's old style, like OSPF. You don't have two in independent implementation, and you don't, cannot hook them up, and they work flawlessly. Don't even show up or the four, you know, to. Uh, to standardize the stuff. Um, yeah, so that was very successful in, in, in this respect. I mean, we're talking six months pretty much from like spec publishing to shaking out the spec while the implementation were progressing and basically being interrupted all the time. So the monkey testing would be now the interesting thing, I would say, you know, to understand how can you take a protocol spec which is modeled and then somehow from the model understand what you're supposed to shake to actually maybe we need to annotate, annotate the models and maybe it needs like a meta model description like you sh you shall shake that and expect this i don't know we are breaking ground in a, in a certain sense all exciting you do not share my sense of elation <laughs> it's okay all right Question to either you or Alistair. Do we have any timelines for another open source implementation? For instance, learning Sorry? the FRR implementation. Do we have any timelines? Alistair Woodman, NetDev, uh, responding to the chair's question. No, we don't have any timelines at the moment. That's why we're asking for folks to get involved, uh, see how many people turn up, what happens. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Cool. 
So next one is about the multicast. Uh, me and Pascal will be doing this presentation. I'll get, get it started and then I'll hand it over to Pascal. So the, the core design team, while they were working on the flooding reduction, they realized that uh, a byproduct of the flooding reduction is actually a multicast, uh, multicast or even better, uh, a broadcast tree that you can use to send traffic anywhere from anywhere. And so that, and that does not require any additional signal, it's already built in. And so the one thought was that that could be used for multicast purpose. Um, and then we had more discussions, um, and it turns out that, uh, well, this is actually very similar to the pin binder concept um, in that uh, the, tra the traffic tra travels north all the way, and then along the way, they fork down to the south to reach the re uh, receivers. Um, so, but further considerations and discussions led to us uh, thinking that we, we, we probably should uh, still uh, use separate uh, signaling for Magicas uh, after all, uh, so that we can have better load balancing for elephant flows and mice flows. Because uh, if you just use this, uh, a few tree to send traffic anywhere, everywhere, then it, that works well for, for, for low volume flow, low rate flows, but if you have what we call it elephant flows, then it's not good. So the current thinking, uh, nothing has been decided, it's just a current thinking is that uh, we would just enhance and extend the PIM bidirectional concept um, and, and yeah, use the native rift signaling uh, to set up multicast uh, trees. So uh, a little bit of background on PIM bidirectional. Uh, in pin binder, if you need, you want to uh, receive uh, a group uh, multicast traffic, you would send star C joins uh, towards a rendezvous point address. That uh, that address, we we'll call it RPA, is either on a particular router, or it's just an address on a LAN that is not bound to any router. It could be it's just a virtual address out there, and the link that hosts that RPA is we call it called the RP link or RPL. It could be a loopback interface on a router or it could be a LAN interface. So the start joins will establish subtrees that are rooted on the uh, routers on the RPL. And the RPL, the RP link will connect the subtrees into a tree. So when you, when you need to send traffic, you, um, the, uh, you, the first hub router will send the uh, traffic upstream towards the RPA following that subtree, and eventually it will arrive at the RPL routers. And along the way, the traffic also fork uh, to downstream routers where you have received the StarG joins from. Um, and then for the traffic that arrives at RPL routers, they just flood traffic uh, to, to each other if, you are, if that's the LAN case, uh, if they are on the LAN instead of on loopback interface. If, you are, if it's on loopback interface, then you, you are the only R, R, RPL router there. Um, so in the LAN case, they just flood to each other, that's fine, it's a, it's a LAN. And, and then if, and the, the RPL router, when it received the traffic on the LAN, the RPL, it will just send the traffic back down to, uh, to uh, receivers uh, on, the, uh, on the downstream side. So um, if we were adopt the, adapt this for Rift, um, there is actually no need for that explicit RPA, RPA address anymore. You just, because of the nice south-north uh, 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 topology, you just simply send your joins upstream to, 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 the north, to, to your north neighbors. Um, well, you sh uh, just to one of the, your north neighbors, uh, you can do a hash to decide which neighbor you should send to. There is one problem um, uh, that there is no RPL in this case. You could have several 
uh, top of the uh, fabric, we call it top, top routers at, at the top, and they are not connected to each other. Pascal Tuber, Cisco. Um, another way of saying exactly what you're saying is that the RPL is a non-broadcast multi-access network as opposed to a broadcast network. So you have to handle, which is yeah. another way of saying what you're saying. Okay. The RPL is non-broadcast multi-access. Right. So, uh, the, the, so how do we solve that? Uh, is that, that uh, Pascal will, will talk about that. Um, and then, Instead of uh, star G trees, we actually start uh, establish bidirectional star G prefix trees. That G prefix can be either a, a G host or a star to the two extremes. So in the star star case, it's a, it's a tree that can be used for, for any group if you, if you don't care that uh, the traffic goes to where there is actually no receiver. Those can be used for mice flows. And then you can have uh, star G host trees. You can, we can use that for elephant flows. Then the traffic is sent on, uh, only where there are actual receivers. And then in the middle, you have the star G prefix uh, trees. It can be used for, we call it giraffe flows or whatever flows, basically the flows that um, you can allow it to go somewhere where there is no receiver, but uh, it's it's not going any uh, everywhere. So you, this gives us very good flexibility because you can start with uh, a single star star tree. And if you know your your traffic pattern is that you don't have much, you don't have any elephant flows. You then you don't have, need, need much state. You don't need much signaling. You just use a single star star tree to send traffic everywhere, like that traffic. And for you can establish. Uh, a few more star G prefixes for your giraffe flows. And eventually if you realize that, oh, I have uh, one group or a hundred group or a thousand group that where I have, uh, uh, have uh, high rate uh, flows, then I will establish those trees accordingly, only when you, when you need it. Um, so the joins, in, uh, in the pin binder here will be uh, done by the northbound uh, PGPs, policy guided prefix uh, uh, ties. It's consumed and merged and re originated at every hub. It's only sent, but uh, the PGP is normally sent to all your neighbors, down, uh, north neighbors or, or south neighbors. But here, when it's used for uh, uh, establishing the tree, we will send it to just one of the north neighbors. And that is chosen by the uh, hashing down by the down, uh, uh, the south neighbor. Um, that hashing um, should uh, have this uh, um, characteristic that um, you uh, different nodes should choose the same upstream nodes, but you do not cause the upstream node to, to, to have to replicate to many, many downstream nodes. So let's say you, you have, uh, um, at one layer you have, uh, uh, let's say you have an EON node that, um, what's the word? Uh, okay, so because the, the, um, in the Fed tree you have many, many ECMP paths, so it could be that, um, all 128 nodes at one layer could be connected to, to, to the same or all another 128 nodes in, in, in the next up layer. So you want to avoid the situation where the upstream, uh, a north neighbor is sent rep replicating 128 times to all the downstream neighbors. So ideally you will be like that. Some of the neighbor downstream neighbors are hashed to one upstream some other downstream neighbors has yet another upstream, and and the, but eventually they will converge at the top. So that way, the, the replication is more efficient, and yet it's not too demanding for for any node. Um, so that's um, with that those joins with those uh, sub uh, we establish the subtrees, and we also establish the corresponding forwarding state, and. That forwarding state include the interface list, 
um, that in the interface list, including the uh, northbound interface that is uh, produced by the hashing, and also a southbound interface on which a join has been received from. Um, and then traffic arriving on any of the interfaces are forwarded out of other interfaces in the list. But traffic received on any other interfaces will be, will be dropped. That's the way you prevent the looping. So coming back to the RPL problems, we need to uh, uh, join that those disjoin subtrees rooted at the subtop node, and I will handle that to Pascal. Is the better person to explain this? Plenty of time. Okay, so uh, Pascal, you are here. I just uh, asked the chair how much time they gave me for this, and they said plenty. Plenty is good, so I'm going to use plenty. Um, first thing is, uh, I will, I will paraphrase you somehow because it doesn't hurt saying things twice, I guess. And now we have illustration to, to just say what you just said, Jeffrey. So, so we started uh, with something we thought uh, very simple. As Jeffrey said in his first slide, what we wanted to do is basically reuse the topology that we built for the optimized flooding. And as you know, this, this topology that we built for the optimized flooding has the property that uh, there are pretty much a uh, redundant path between any leaf and any tuff. So you forget whatever is in the middle, but between any particular leaf and any particular top of fabric node, there is a redundant way to get there. So we thought, hey, what if we just send the multicast packets north, whatever they are, to any top of spy, a top of fabric node, and that particular top of fabric node would reflect the, the packet over the redundant path that reaches any leaf. That was the initial thought. So without changing anything, as, as Jeffrey said, we thought uh, we could achieve um, an efficient multicast just using the fabric and, and the state that exists in the fabric. If you wanted to filter by star G, you would just um, flood the star G information north only through the flood repeaters, which would make it so that only the, the, the traffic to, to, to that particular group would, would flood through the repeaters only if there is a leaf which is actually listening for it. I mean, with this simple assumption, we, we were already there. We had a redundant way to distribute the multicast traffic to groups or to everybody if we wanted to as a broadcast. There were two issues with that. The first issue was um, we had to make a different routing decision for a packet going north and a packet going south. And that's really what probably killed, well, not killed because everything is still on the table, we have not written the text yet. But, but the reason why we are opting out of using the uh, optimized flooding topology is to avoid having to make a, this different decision if the packet is coming from south or the packet is going from north. Right, with this, this pretty much sparse mode-like uh, model that we had, if you get a packet from, from south, then you, you propagate it north to any of, of the parents north. It will reach any of the TOF, which will reflect itself. So that, that was one behavior. Now, if you get the packet from the, the, the north, then you would have to, to pass it down to everybody who elected you as a flood repeater. So that's a different behavior. You would have to, to basically do two different operations. And depending on the silicon, et cetera, et cetera, that, that could hurt. So we kind of uh, did not prefer this way. The other problem you could have with this design was uh, the fallen leaf problem. If you have a particular leaf, which is not reachable by a particular uh, top of fabric node, it's a fallen leaf by definition, then if the multi packet as it flows uh, randomly north um, reaches that particular top of fabric and there is a listener on the particular fallen leaf for that top of fabric node, that listener would not get the multi packet, right? It's the prime of the fallen leaf. So how to handle that? That was, that was also something which, which made the proposal, which looked initially very uh, simple and efficient, 
uh, having to handle this kind of corner case, uh, would we disaggregate or whatever else? Um, that kind of looked painful. And then the, the, on the side, there is this mis-optimization versus by deer. Whereas, you know, if you have by deer, then when you propagate north, you can, uh, at each level, you can start sending the pack itself, which means that you, you get a more efficient use of your fabric. So we kind of moved from that model onto another model whereby we, as, as Jeffrey said again, we build those subtrees. Um, and the subtrees are very dynamic. That has the nice property of the, of the optimized flooding, which is any node at a certain level, say level zero in this slide, say node L4, just to pick an example, can pick any of the uh, nodes above as his parent as we build this tree. There can be many reasons why we, um, we build a tree, but you can pick any of your parent and change that over time. Doesn't mean you have to reshuffle and tell everybody in the network. It's an individual decision by every node. L4 can pick M2 at some point of time, and so it's gonna be on the uh, orange tree, but five minutes later, if it decides to, it can join M4. And you don't have to tell anybody above or do anything so fancy, at least as long as you don't advertise uh, um, subgroups. But just to build trees, uh, it's, it's a local and efficient decision. So we kind of said, hey, um, let's build the subtrees which are rooted at the subtuff, at the subtuff being uh, what we define as the level right below the tuff. So we had to define that, that weird beast, which is the subtuff. And we build those trees, and we might decide to build different trees that we would access for different groups, etc. But I'm just describing what we do for just one, the first multi, big multicast tree. So let's let's have any node select one parent, and that ends up building a collection of non-congruent trees, which are rooted at the subtuff, just by individual decision of every node of finding one, on selecting one parent. Okay, so, so the big problem with, we have is that now is to, to interconnect those trees into a bigger tree. And now we are back to the Pim Baidir question of all this big thing here, you know, this level I have illustrated with this kind of circle, becomes virtually the RPL. That's the link on which all the, the small trees we discussed are all rooted. But the, the interesting problem we have with Rift here is that this RPL is non-broadcast multi-access. It's not a token ring, it's not an ethernet, it's not uh, the air. You can't push a packet there from, you know, a packet coming from the south, through M1, say, the packet comes from there. If it was an ethernet, you would just broadcast it and then every other N1, N2, N3, N4 would get the packet and be able to flood itself. But that's not the case, it's non-broadcast. So we have to handle this network and again, make it so that if, if a packet comes from N1 is injected in this RPL, it, it can go out of N2, N3, N4, N5. So what kind of structure do we put in place to um, enable this NBMA RPL? And that's again a point that Jeffrey made and I will paraphrase. How can we make it so that the tree is well balanced? If the tree is too fat, like we pick the, the same guy here to reflect to everybody, then if there are 100 nodes here, this guy will have to make 100 copies. That, that's a very fat tree that's kind of efficient in terms of how many hops a packet will take, but that's a lot of load for that packet on that particular node. On the other hand, if we make a very lean tree, like we could say, oh, connect this guy in a Z, then a particular packet going, uh, being injected here would be echoed all the way before it can reach this guy and go down his tree. So, so there is this, this problem of, of building a spanning structure that, that would enable the RPL operation in a way that's balanced enough, fat enough, but not too fat, kind of. So that, that, that's what we've, we've been uh, looking at. So I have uh, represented, uh, I have two slides to explain not a, the final solution, we are not there yet, but kind of the thinking where we are and, and that's when, you know, inputs are so, so great. So the thinking we have is, so let's, be, let's, let's build this uh, non-broadcast multi-access uh, uh, RPL and here is how we could do it. 
because we want, like I said, to balance the, the level of fatness of the tree that we're building between the sub -tough and the top. The idea is basically to, for a given tree we're building, elect a subset of those guys as the, the, the level of the tree that we'll be building to, to do this RPL thing. And for instance, we could be again using a hash and the hash would elect like the five or the 10 best TOF nodes to be the, the, the reflectors in, in, in that NBMA RPL. So in my uh, slide here, uh, the hash has pretty much determined that those two guys are the best candidates, S3 and S4, as the best, you know, the best hash for whatever we are doing. So everybody will pick one of those two uh, as the, the, the reflector for them. So in this case, N3 and N5 parent to S3, and N4 parents to S4. And so what we've done is we've extended the subtrees all the way to the top now. Okay, so we still have non-congruent trees, but instead of being uh, rooted at the sub tough, we, they are rooted at the top, and we have kind of converged them in a way that it's not distributed over all the top, it was kind of distributed over all the sub tough, but now we have kind of constrained the number of tough nodes which participate to this game. And now what we have to do is basically uh, complete the tree so that S3 can talk to S4. So that's kind of the second step that we illustrate here. And that's the piece that requires an additional signaling. We have not found a way to do that without a minimal additional signaling. And the additional signaling that we need is to make sure that all those subtrees converge onto the same tree as opposed to making islands of, of uh, for instance, if there was S3, S4, S5, S6, S7, S9, which could all be roots of the subtree, if we try to join them blindly, maybe we, that we could build two, two islands, S3, S5, S6, and S4, S7, S9, I don't know. How do you make it sure that, that if they can, they all merge into a single structure, which is what we want to build? And the way to do that is to to expose like a token, to expose something which will, they, they all will want to reach. And so what we said so far is that we could use the uh, system ID of, we could expose the system ID of the highest of those routes, right? So, so far we had S3 and S4. So they both have system IDs and actually represent the nodes left to right with, to the smallest, smallest to highest system ID. And so as we expose, um, if, if all the nodes N3, N4, N5 expose the system ID of their parent, so N4 here would expose that its, its root kind of is S4, um, N3 and N5 would expose that their root is S3. Now, through, through, through this uh, information, S3 can realize there is a root with a higher system ID than self. So what it would try to do is establish a link, this link here, between it and the child of this higher system ID. And it might be that uh, because of this jointness and partition stuff, S3 doesn't see a child of S4, right? But it might see a child of another node with, with, with a higher system ID than self, and um, that node would see the, uh, the main root. So that's in, in order to be able to, to make this single tree, you need to expose the, not only yourself, but also the tree you belong to. You need to say, as, as, as S3 joins, you know, S4, S4 tree, it needs now to expose, hey, I'm, I'm linked to the tree uh, re super rooted by S4. So that's the thing which is not in the current signaling is how to expose, hey, actually, um, the main tree I belong to is, is S4. And now we could talk, so, so that's where we are in the thinking. We, we would have to, to expose S4 as part of the signaling uh, and to relay it, that's the name of the tree that I'm building to build this RPL. And, well, is it agreeable to do that? And we are, we can, at the next step, start thinking, hey, now, what, what if there is a churn, change, etc.? And that's one we probably would need to introduce a distance. So basically, it's, it's, it's all about building a, a tree of, of those roots which were selected by the sub -tuff. So now we have joined them together. And the result of, of what we build with this is a spanning structure 
that spans uh, all the leaves, pretty much all the subtof, all those which were selected as apparent, and some of the tough node, the limited set, and we can decide the size of this limited set, because that's what decides how fat the, the, the tree that we build for the RPL is. And that's pretty much where we are. This is for the particular example that I designed here. So you see, I just picked some of the tough and sub tough nodes. I, I established those links. What you can see now is the resulting spanning structure. And like we said earlier, we can build a number of them. And the operation of this spanning structure is, as Jeffrey said, if you uh, inject a packet anywhere, say M1 injects a packet, N1 will copy the packet along the structure, just like a spanning tree thing, um, on all the other interfaces in the structure. And the result of this operation is a basic flooding of the structure, which will make it so that the packet is distributed everywhere along the structure. Now, we can do the exact same thing if we want to install a route like star G, right? If this guy installs, a, wants to say, I have a listener for star G, he can send the advertisement, I have a listener for star G, and then one will advertise that, and it will be flooded through the structure. And there can also be a listener here, which will be flooded through the structure. Now, a node in the middle will know through which interfaces it got the flooding for a listener to star G and is now able to send the packet to star G only on those interfaces as a filter. So you see, you don't, that's what Jeffrey said again earlier, you don't need to have the concept of, of a super root up there like we usually do in Baidia. We just have this, this flooding structure and we can install you know, uh, the, the filters if we want to, to send the star G only to some destinations. Or we can use it as a broadcast. And paraphrasing you again, so I'm sure the message is passed. We built one tree, I can build 100 trees, right? As many as I like. And then we can decide which multicast flows go into which tree. The thinking that we wanted to achieve is build those trees proactively. So we don't make them dependent on the star Gs. We may make them dependent on the giraffe flows. I mean, that's part of why you introduced those giraffe flows. But the idea is don't dynamically try to build a structure like this each time you have a new group coming in. Just build a number of those structures and then decide for a new star G or for a flow. Do you use one of the structures broadcast for mice flows or what? Or do you just affect a particular star G on one of those particular pre-existing spanning structures? And that's pretty much where we are. I don't think we have another slide. So was it clear? Two approaches on the table. One is like sparse modes and everything north, which is any, any leaf, any, I'm sorry, any tough. And that tough will use the reverse flooding reduction, uh, reduction path to reach the leaves. That's option one. Prime with option one, we have to have different routing between things coming from south and things coming from north. Option two, build a number of those spanning structures. Use the tough to sub uh network as a non-broadcast multi-access RPL. Build something into it which is not too fat, not too lean, not too long. And that completes the whole subtrees into a bigger uh, spanning structure. These are kind of the two options we have on the table right now. Any... Hmm. Question, what did you say about no question? <laughs> Tony earlier, when there's no question, it means what? <laughs> Hi, Bill Finner, uh, Arista Networks. I just have a question that I think is just an oversight on this slide, but the uh, purple tree is actually isolated. There should be a link to the... Oh, yes, it's on our site. <laughs> Sorry, it, I will fix it. Okay, it's either, it was either really confusing or just a little mistake. So I'm so I'm, sorry. I'm glad it was just yeah. a little mistake. Yeah, I, that's, I think this slide was completed like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and because for, for the other explanation, I had to take out some notes, and when I, I completed this slide with the other ones, I forgot to draw this slide. Yes, so sorry. I will fix it. So you see the whole idea, I mean, some of those end nodes uh, subbed off are parents, you know, for trees going to leaves, um, and then you have to join them. The, the, another question, which is an option here, is whether 
you are, you're only interested is if the tree, if the, see, see for instance N1, uh, N1 has leaves down this tree, so so is an interesting guy, quote unquote. If, if all the listeners are on leaves, then if you have somebody maybe like M3 and N2, are you interested in those guys because they don't reach leaves? So the, the idea, the, the, the point was, oh, let's build the trees even for guys like M3, which don't have leaves behind them, because it might be that later, because of a breakage or anything, L3 might decide to reparent to M3. And if it's the only time when we start to build the whole thing all the way north, then it, we will incur delay f finishing the formation of the tree. So we decided to form the tree even from nodes like M3, which don't have leaves, so probably will not have listeners, because maybe someday uh, L3, L4, whoever, will reparent to them and we want the tree to be ready to, to operate. So, so that's pretty much why you see this N2 to M3 link here, even if there is no leaf behind it. So putting those uh, subtops uh, into the tree, even if they don't have children, that's basically like simulating a, a lane up here, up here, right? So yeah. yeah. We, we, we always we, get traffic, um, even if you don't have the downstream receivers. It's just exactly like the pin binder case where the RPL is a lane. We are doing an RPL, it's just it's an NBMA network. So it's a bit more complex than doing broadcast. Mr. Tony. Um, I think it was a couple of subtleties that you missed. So we also thought through the problem if some of the mo uh, nodes are not multicast capable, right? Uh, we talk about that stuff. Uh, yeah, you c a parent would only be selectable right. if he expresses the capability. Right, so it will work also if you have a mix of uh, multicast capable and non-capable. Uh, this solution does not reach all the TOFs, right? That's what we concluded. So if you have receivers on the TOFs, that won't work. If 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 the TOF wants to be including in the tree, they will operate just like the sub -tof. They will select and then to you. So we could, if we wanted to, I've not represented it. Uh, right now it's kind of built with the thought, thought that the listeners are on the leaves. But if it's, it's easy for any, for S1, for instance, if S1 is not part of the game here, uh, to see that the tree is building and to, to join any, just like we did S3, so you see at some point S3 decided to join the tree. S1 could have decided to join the tree for its own purpose. Um, so if we wanted to have listeners on the uh, on S1, then we could we could take the same step as S3 did and S1 would. Ah, okay, so that's the new signaling. So I actually didn't see the signaling stuff that you guys converge on. I don't see much of a problem there. That's just with the add things to the node ties and that's it. Well, the, the only signaling we really want is the root ID of the main root that we are joining. Yeah. Uh, we might want to avoid, you know, weird case of loops to have this notion of distance. If, if you have to go through a number of those routes to reach S4. Yeah, let's not get too cute, but I think, you know, the, the, the basic signaling is not a problem. So we don't actually need PGP at all to build this kind of structure. So the star comma star would just fall out for free. Right. Yeah. It's only the start command G when we have to start to push PGP and store state if we want to prune, right? If we the want structures. to prune. All right, cool. Yeah. So, and, and like I said, we can build a hundred of these trees if we like, and they will be, uh, we can also control how concurrent they are. We looked at all those options, but right now I just, I just represented how to build one, just for the yeah. sake of understanding how we do that. Yeah, and I think the idea is not to put it into base spec because all the stuff we can, you know, put on optionally on the existing schema without breaking the major, right? Including the capability, whether you're multicast capable. All right. So, I mean, maybe one question to the group is, is um, check if we were wise to kind of forget about the north, uh, well, the, the sparse mode way of doing things, which like, like I said, takes everything to, to one tough and then uses the reverse flooding reduction path to, to reach the leaves. We, we kind of remove that idea or put it on, on the side because of the difference of routing north-south to south-north. If, if there is any hint on that, if we are right to do that, then it's, it's a good time to tell us. 
Mm -hmm. Sunny Zhang, Niti, mm, I'd like to ask uh, some simple question because uh, this is my first time to see the solution. Uh, uh, the first question is, uh, is there any uh, star G or, and uh, SG state in the topology? Okay, so we, we, did, we said that for mice flows, we could actually build a topology which would be like a broadcast and we would send to every leaf through that broadcast topology and then there would not be uh, uh, any star G or SG, S, G state to the network. Then we said, A, um, if we have what we call elephant flows, I mean, you can come back to, to Jeffrey's slides here. If we have very fat flows, we don't want to flood them through the whole network. And that's when we would like to install uh, star G or whatever state uh, in the tree. The key thing uh, is that we want to build the tree first and not wait for having a new group show up. So we build the spanning structures and w if we want to use one of the structures for a particular star G, say, what we're going to do is, I think I hinted that, is populate state um, for instance, if there is a G listener here, it would flood, I have a listener for star G, and this guy will learn, oh, there is a listener on that interface, and then he will flood it. So this guy would learn, oh, I have a, uh, actually, this guy would learn, I have a listener on that interface, etc. So you know on which sides you've got listeners, and yes, you would need to install that. And then when there is a packet, you would only instead of flooding it through all the other interface but the one you got it from, you would add as an additional filter only if there is a, a star G uh, listener. So um, we have not yet really explained written text about exactly how that works, but you may figure that this structure is a, a logical topology, like a virtual topology overlaid over the whole fabric, and that's inside that virtual topology you flood. So to just to, to add that, uh, you, can, you could just have simple, uh, a few star, star, or star C prefix state in, 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 net, in the network. And then if you start sending uh, traffic, then the, 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 the traffic will match one of those uh, uh, folding state there, whether it's a star, star, or it's a star C prefix, uh, or it could be a US, uh, existing star G uh, state, and then be forwarded. Basically, if it's, it's like the, the longest match for Unicat's case. It will match one of the existing state here. Okay, thank you. And then, as Salvaro said, we need to use the list, so uh, don't hesitate posting questions on the list and, and let's discuss that. Bill Fenner, uh, one more question about the star star versus star G, et cetera. Do you imagine dynamically deciding whether a given group is going to have uh, be an elephant or use the star? Right now, we don't know how to make those two leaves together on the same structure because it, we would need a negative G kind of. Right, sure. It's, it's um, more like the out-of-band out determination. Okay. If, you, if you know that it, uh, a star, uh, one particular group has, is an elephant flow, then you... And you configure that on all the nodes? Not not configure. Oh, oh all right. Yeah. Uh, you somehow the the the, the node they need to receive traffic, they, they will get notified so that they can they can join that, uh, establish a separate tree for that. Yeah. Right. It's just everybody needs to know when they're establishing the tree, whether they're establishing a star G or they can right. use the star star tree. Yes, if right. It's, we we talk about the, the various the various like, possible means. Uh, it, it could be that um, you use the existing uh, uh, star star tree to flood a notification. Sure. So that's one way, or then it's a, another auto band way to, to somehow a, a controller kind of thing, if you will. <laughs> in, in, in the initial approach to so yeah. the one that goes north and then south, we basically could have just flooded G as if it was a unicast address or any cast address. And so the packets would have gone north and then they would have been flooded because recognized as multicast and flooded along the, the uh, um, flooding reduction path. So, so the signaling was pretty much the one we already have. 
um, if we want to do, if we want to have S in the picture, then obviously <laughs> you can't. No, I don't. So, so we, we were not taking, uh, uh, well, so far we have not been asked to go all the way to S. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about S. I was just thinking about the distinction between the mice and the elephants and the giraffes. Yeah, you, you kind and they of can't be, know. the problem with the mice is you don't have any state for it. Right, So, exactly. So if, if there is a packet, is it a G for which I have no listener or, or is it is it a, a mice? And so that's why I say just elliptically said we would need to be able to signal negative G. Uh, there is this G, but I don't want it. Right, okay, great. As long as you're thinking about that problem. Thanks. So there is another observation, and I know you guys didn't think about this stuff yet, but the star star without the signaling could also build a beer structure that would also work fine. It would do the beer forwarding that way. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect timing. So we have finished all our agenda. Um, any further question, comments on any of our things here? Okay. Uh, blue sheets.